All righty, let's uh, begin first of all with a, a short prayer. Father, we praise you for the day and time in which we live. We ask you to teach us how to use the time here for your benefit and for the benefit of the people around us. We ask your particular protection upon people who have been exposed to the virus. We ask this in the name of Jesus, the Lord. We were discussing um, the uh, Africa last time and uh, in concluding this thing of Africa, in 1873, perhaps the most famous of all the African missionaries was David Livingston. Now we tend to think of David Livingston as the discoverer of the source of the uh, Nile. But uh, while well, that's true, he initially went there as a medical missionary and exploring was sort of his hobby. But he really got involved in this with regards to the Nile River. He worked against slavery, he treated the natives with respect, and he was seeking to learn from them as well as teach them. One of the, one of the things we watch in missionary effort is whether you come in with the desire to impose a culture or you come in and are absorbed into the culture. In missionary terms, when someone's absorbed into the culture, we refer to them as going native. And in that effect, they, um, they really don't bring anything to the place they're going. But if they aren't interested in finding out about the culture, what happens is that they, um, they, they end up trying to crush the culture or do away with it. And <clears throat> every culture that I know of that has tried to study another culture and entered into the study has been enriched. So the culture is enriching. You know, in the United States, if you would look at the United States as a country, um, because we were having all these different groups come in at once equally, and I exclude the Native Americans from this because they did suffer under this. But the others coming in, the, there was no idea that you should impose Italian customs on the Germans or the Germans on the French. That when these came in, they saw their cultures as something to be preserved as they melded into our society. And the result of that is, you know, that we have magnificent restaurants. We have great cultural celebrations. We have all these things because the, the cultures of the different groups were preserved and they all contributed to one another, one way or another. I, I, I would just take a very simple example. Uh, many of us uh, are very, very fond of Mexican food. And Mexican food, is recipes brought from Spain where the ingredients were replaced with what was available here. And so what was available here, they replaced into the, and it's a whole different cuisine. You can't really say it's in Spain, and you can't really say it was Native American, indigenous. It's a whole different cuisine. You watch the same thing happen with the Cajuns in uh, uh, Louisiana, only there it's French recipes that came in and had to deal with what was here. But the, these are wonderful things when cultures can somehow learn from one another. And Livingston was a great example of that when he came over. At first, Australia, as you probably know, was used as a penal colony for British convicts. They found it easier to turn all of Australia kind of into a prison. And they would dump people there from, from England uh, but as time went on, most of the immigrants began to come as free people. I should tell you, too, that during the period in which Australia was being used as this penal colony, far and away the largest number of people over there were Catholics. And they were usually Catholics from Ireland, part of the, the difficulties that were going on with the British dealing with the Catholics in Ireland. Um, the white population came largely from Britain and Ireland, and the Catholic population was largely Irish. But the church was very well organized in Australia. Very quickly, there were bishops appointed and bishops' councils, and a cardinal served as the Archbishop of Sydney. 
largely understand that a lot of the Irish that were sent over there were in fact priests and nuns. So like the, like the church came as, as part of the conflicts. Whites came to New Zealand largely from Britain and Ireland. And the growth of the Catholic Church was much the same as it was in Australia, with the big difference that in Australia, the Catholic Church constituted a majority. In New Zealand, the country of New Zealand was really established by the Anglicans. And as a, in the same way the Puritans came to, the, uh, came to North America, the Anglicans came to uh, New Zealand to establish uh, uh, basically uh, uh, a society for the English. The uh, population of Ze New Zealand between 1860 and 1920, the population of New Zealand doubled and that of Australia increased by five. Um, both of these countries were leaders in social practices. It's really interesting that, you know, once they got away, one of the, the the amazing things to me is when you study history, a lot of changes that they wanted to make, let's say in France that led to the French Revolution and everything, were adopted almost immediately when they came to the United States. A lot of the changes they were angling for in England, the Puritans and stuff with regards to religion, were changed immediately when they came to the United States. A lot of times when these, these things move, they advance the things that the other cultures are just so slow with. But if you look at, uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, just a simple thing like women voting. Women voting came in Australia and New Zealand long before it was seen anywhere else in the world. It just really, really came immediately there. In the 1800s, many of the Protestant communities were working for a union among the churches. There was seen as a, a you know, the, the fact, when you begin to do missionary work, for instance, suppose we take, let's, let's say the Congregationalist Church and let's say the Presbyterian Church. Congregationalists and the Presbyterians are organized pretty much the same structurally. Their beliefs are the same. They hold the same doctrines and everything. And you would have a little tiny town there, and you'd have a, a missionary from the Congregationalists and a missionary from the Presbyterians there. And they began to see very quickly that actually the Presbyterian could run both of those churches, and the Congregationalists could go to the next town and establish the churches there. And so the, they began to look among themselves. There seemed to be kind of a foolish duplication and they began to look among themselves. You may or may not be aware of that happening under uh, John Paul. John Paul looked around the world and the same thing was going on. We would have Catholic missionaries here and Baptist missionaries there and Methodist missionaries there. And while we all have a different structure in our church, you know, when we go into an area to present the faith, we're starting at the bottom. And what is the bottom? Jesus Christ died, risen from the dead. Okay, it's very simple. And the creed that we hold, the Nicene Creed or the Apostles' Creed, is universal. We all hold it. So what they wanted to do was get together so that we weren't duplicating missionaries. The, the Catholics weren't really trying to convert Presbyterians, but trying to convert non-Christians. And the Presbyterians weren't trying to convert Catholics. And they had a meeting in Assisi in uh, uh, Italy at the place where uh, Francis is buried. And they, they pulled together all these different denominations. The only people not involved were the fundamentalists. But all the denominations pulled together and began to make a commitment like that and began to work in the missionaries that they were able to cover a much wider area in doing that sort of thing. But anyway, in the 1800s, many of the Protestant churches were looking for union, and this was largely the result of their working together as missionaries, particularly in Africa. Okay, this, this is a result of their work in Africa. As an example of this work to unity among the, moder the Protestants, 
A good example is an organization you and I all know very well, which is the YMCA. The YMCA is not a church, but it's an organization of Christians of all different kinds of denominations. Very active in the United States, as we know, they sponsored sports events, activities, educational and religious gatherings. They're really a very, very powerful group. Uh, when I was in San Diego, one of the major things they were doing, they provided a military YMCA so that they, the military YMCA provided uh, facilities and everything for military men away from the military base itself and not involved in bars and that sort of thing, but they had all kinds of sports events and everything. And so they, they were a powerful thing. And again, they are not a religion, but they are a collection of Christians. Lewis Watson, an Anglican Episcopal priest, founded the Society of the Atonement in New York. Um, he used the word atonement because what he wanted to do was to try and get the churches together. And he started by trying to unite the Anglican or the Church of England with the Roman Catholic because they're very similar in the way they worship and stuff like that. So he wanted to bring them together. So he founded this organization and they were called the Society of the Atonement. Uh, they came to be known as the Friars of the Atonement. They dress very much like Franciscans. And um, the reason why he used the, the name atonement if you look carefully, it's at one month. And so that's why he used the word atonement. It was, to, it was to bring them together. He started the Church Unity Octave, which was eight days of prayer for church unity, particularly between the Episcopal and the Catholic churches. So he's tried to foster this devotion uh, as, a, as a way of prayer, prayer, praying for unity. And as an example of that, when I was pastor at the mission, uh, we were requested by Rome at one particular Sunday, and I even forget it where it was, but it was part of this octave of church unity that comes up once a year. But what the Vatican asked us to do was switch books with other churches. So we used the books from First Presbyterian uh, for our readings that day. They have the same readings we do, all our churches, the the Methodists, the Episcopal, that we all use the same readings. Theirs, however, are taken out of the King James Bible. Ours were taken out of the New American Bible at that time. So anyway, but we switched the books and we would announce that this book was from Presbyterian Church and then did the readings out of it. But they used to do different things periodically, and not being a pastor now, I'm not familiar with it. But we used to do different things periodically so the churches were working with one another uh, during this church unity. He took the name Father Paul and he in his entire community at one point joined the Roman Catholic Church. So he and his whole community decided the best thing they could do for unity after studying was to join the Roman Catholic Church. And as a result of that, this thing of church unity is a major Roman Catholic celebration each year. I'd like to remind you, remember with the Oxford movement with Cardinal Newman, that they were working for the union of the Anglicans with the Catholics only seen as parallel from the foundations. They didn't want to become one church, but they were parallel. But ultimately the leaders of that all ended up Roman Catholics. They finally made the decision that that was how they could best foster the, uh, the union of the churches. Uh, in the 1900s, around the end of the 19th century, millions of people left their native lands and began to look at better places for them to live. Now the 1900s, think of the 1900s. What we see then is first of all, transportation as far as the ships going back and forth across the seas are safer, you know, the, and, and travel is easier and this sort of thing and people have more money. So now huge numbers are moving all over the world. Uh, immigration was to the cities and a huge percentage of that, as you can imagine, was to the Americas. At this time, South America was just as much a goal as North America. 
at this time, the 1900s, the, uh, you know, South America was established nations and stuff like this. So most often the immigrants found their re uh, respective churches provided the help necessary to integrate into the new society. So that if you, if you were uh, an Italian and you arrived in New York, you'd go to a part of the city known as Little Italy. And you would go there and when you went there, uh, you'd find that most of the people there knew Italian. They mo most of them spoke English at the time, but they would know Italian having come there. The church knew Italian and you would integrate into the parish and then the parish would help you get organized and that sort of thing. Uh, it's very similar today in Los Angeles. Like if you go down the freeway, it'll, it'll say Little Saigon, which is a, a Vietnamese area, and Little India, which is a place. And the, these are, are like small groups in Los Angeles. They were that way in, uh, uh, what do you call it, in New York at one time. It isn't that way much in, in New York, but the way, still way you can identify it, the most famous Italian restaurants there are in the area that used to be Little Italy. The best, you know, Spanish restaurants from Spain are the area of the Spain, but you, you find that goes on. But the, as far as being independent little ghettos now, they really aren't. Francis Xavier Cabrini was an Italian nun at this time and she founded a religious order at the request of the Pope and came to the United States specifically to work among Italian immigrants. And while she was here, she founded hospitals, schools. She worked among miners in Colorado and the inmates of Sing Sing Prison. And she eventually died as an American citizen. But she did a huge amount of work. It, it, I would love to see sometime a history of this period in the United States and in Australia and in New Zealand concentrated only on the work of nuns. It was phenomenal what was going on at this time. These women would come and in the new society, you know, with so many men that were immigrating and everything, uh, women held positions of honor in the society and particularly nuns. They were very protected and taken care of, and they did an amazing amount of work. They had almost an immunity in society. Around this time, many of the discoveries and inventions of the 19th century began to change the, peop the way people were living their lives. At the same time, changed the way they viewed the world. Remember, we saw these inventions come up, like the steam engine and stuff like that. And basically what it was at that time was they were used to run factories and things like this. And this will see like, for instance, the Stanley Steamer, which is a, a automobile run by steam. And we'll see steam come into common usage on, on farms and stuff where they have steam engines running things. They had steam engines running things that would use to cut wood and stuff like that. But we began to see these inventions that seem so exotic. This thing happens very fast now. When I was in, uh, in high school, my dad was working on the Atlas missile and he was working on the very first computer that was ever built, which was the Univac. And it was put in with cards with holes punched in them. But anyway, a massive building and he, he worked on that. And to think of that, no person in fact, I doubt if anyone other than the government could afford the UNIVAC. The UNIVAC was a fantastic thing. And today, every person that I know of has an iPad or a computer in their house, but the computer has moved from being that exotic tool to a necessary part of everyone's phone today. It's just, but technology didn't move that fast at this time in history, but now the, Inventions of the uh, 19th century came in and that changed the way people viewed the world. Transportation changed dramatically. The gasoline motor came into use in 1888, the automobile in 1891, the telephone in 1876, movies in 1894, and the wireless telegraph 
in 1895. X-rays came into being in 1895, and electricity came into everyday use in people's homes. Just imagine all of that, like overnight, and, and it just began to be a part of society itself. There were many changes as a result of that in the way people viewed the world. The cures are a husband and wife in France, uh, and uh, they discovered radium. Now, radium is even used powerfully in medicine now. When I was a youngster, the implantation of radium pellets in cancer tumors was the major treatment when I was in grade school. Um, but radium came about, and it was used in medicine. People rediscovered the work of Gregor Mendel. Now, he was an Augustinian monk, and he experimented on peas. And what he did was breed peas in different ways for size, for strength, for everything. Because I, I lived in a farming community for a while, I take something like tomatoes. You want to breed a tomato that is not like the tomato just as you have it. If you have a tomato, the plant at home, you know the tomato, when it's ripe, you have a couple of days, and then it's gone, okay? It falls apart and this sort of thing. Now, if you want to take a tomato to market, you have to have one that you can pick green that then is not just gonna rot, but is gonna go on and ripen. You have to have one that skin is strong enough, it can be picked by a machine without destroying the plant. And so this, this idea of harvesting becomes a, a very, very complex issue. And uh, this uh, Mendel was the very first one to experiment on how you could take plants using basically evolution but you could, uh, what do you want to call it, direct the evolution of the plant to end up kind of with, uh, with what you wanted. Um, the quantum theory of Max Platic showed that energy did not come in a steady stream, but in little units. So the, the um, electricity that comes through your the electrothick in your house, actually it, it doesn't flow like a stream of water. It flows like curdled milk that has lumps in it as it goes through. And we, d we have a lot of equipment in our houses from circuit breakers to other things to handle the lumps so that it doesn't, you know, destroy the whole thing. But th this was the first one who discovered that that's the way energy uses. Energy never moves in this steady stream. In 1905, Albert Einstein advanced relativity, showing that time and space were relative to many systems, but were not independent entities. It's like time. If we were to take time, what is time? Time is, by definition, the measure of something in motion. So if you have no motion, you'd have no time. The reason we have time, you know, like the time we have, is because of the cycle of the sun, okay? But the thing is, time in itself is nothing. They thought of time as a thing. It isn't. Time is a way of measuring a bunch of other factors. And that, that's the thing of relativity. Relativity discovers that things are relative to one another rather than independent. And, you know, we, we think of that as a, as a very common thing today. Like if you, uh, you take something simple today, that if, if you were to throw a plastic bottle into the ocean, you think about the consequences of it. Now, whether you think they're important or not, the thing is you think about it's all relative. Relative to how I deal with plastic has to do with the oceans. Relative to the way the wind goes has to do with the weather. But relativity is a, a law that governs everything. 
And we use it in little tiny ways all the time. But it, it was discovered as recently as Einstein in 1905. In 1884, Cardinal James Gibbons provided over the third plenary council of the American bishops. And what he was really advocating was Catholic schools, seminaries, specifically for the education of priests, and the founding of Catholic University in Washington, D.C. He wanted to have a higher thing of learning. And the thing is that our schools were largely Protestant in the United States. Now, we've moved away from that over a period of time, but our student, our schools were largely Protestant because the bulk of people were Protestant. Now, you can't say they were Presbyterian, they weren't, or Anglican, they weren't, but they were Protestant. And so they had this, this, this concept and the teachings of Protestant. Readings all came out of the King James Bible and stuff like that. And so he wanted to have Catholic schools where Catholics were educated in a Catholic environment, and most particularly seminaries where they had the Catholic theology and this sort of thing. If you know much about the universities in the United States, uh, Harvard was originally a seminary. Uh, Yale was originally a seminary. Most of the Ivy League colleges were originally seminaries. If you wanted to be a Catholic priest, there was the only place you would study was you would go to Europe and uh, go to one of the Catholic seminaries over there. So this became a big thing out of that plenary council. Uh, Cardinal Gibbons wanted to see Catholics take a strong part of life in the United States, and he did not want them to remain in small ghettos of national immigrants. So he wanted to see them American Catholics, not just Catholics living in America, but he wanted to see them truly integrated as American Catholics. And so you, you have the concept of democracy over the the rule for wherever they had. You have the, the, the concept of equality of people. You have the concept of, of religion, no religion being supported by the government, but all religions operating independently of the government, and every religion having the same rights, and that all that sort of thing. He wanted us to truly become Americans as Catholics. With the chief moderator of the Presbyterian Church, he organized a parliament of religions where basic religious beliefs were discussed among leading minds of all religions from around the world. So now you see what, what we're doing is taking a step here. We've been talking earlier about the Oxford movement bringing the Anglicans and the Catholics together. We talk about the atonement, which is to try and bring all of Christians together. And now we're talking about bringing all religions together so that, so that we respect one another as religions. Uh, John Heckler, Hecker rather, an American convert to the Catholic Church and the founder of the polis, approached ministry in the same liberal way as Cardinal Gibbons. He answered people's spiritual problems and his approach went very well with the American spirit and ideas. So he dealt, dealt with people's problems and he dealt with them in an American way of dealing with it. One of the, the things you would find about the United States, which I think is, is one of the great glories of the country, is our sense of the need of other uh, of other people in the society. Uh, like Fritz, if you're at, at home, uh, I'm sure you see on TV uh, commercials for Shriners hospitals, and you see commercials for St. Jude's hospitals. It, it would never occur to you that the people for Shriners would say you should give to Shriners rather than Jude's. It would never occur to you that the people from Jude's would say you should give to Jude's and not to Shriners. That isn't done. I'm sure lots of people donate to both. That's the American way of doing things. And when we find out, you know, on the news or something, some terrible calamity has happened somewhere, the whole country sends money. And you'll find money sent through the Catholic organizations, through the Council of Churches organizations, 
through national organizations. We have a great sense of what it is to be American and holding our Catholic principles. The French church became very interested in the work of Heckler uh, as a result of the biography published in the United States and translated into French. They wrote a biography of him and how he worked as far as uh, bringing these uh, uh, the church things together and everything. But most powerfully, he was an advocate of a church independent of the government, but involved in the government by voting and lobbying for different things and stuff like this, but not under the control of the government, and the government did not favor the church. That was what France wanted as the ideal. But remember, the bishops had been so identified with the royalty that when you had the French Revolution, you had a break between the poor and the rich, but that also was a break between the poor and the church. And so it was a, it was a bad thing. The introduction to the book presented in the style of Heckler as the way the French church should, be, should proceed. A conservative French priest responded by listening, listing what he considered errors in, Heckler, in Hecker's books, in Hecker's ideas, and he labeled it Americanism, okay? Whenever you see the word ism, you, you need to know it's pejorative. So when we talk about Catholicism, Ism is sort of a pejorative word. Americanism, uh, it, it oftentimes indicates a pejorative feeling, the word ism. And this was very much against uh, Hecker's uh, books and ideas, but he condemned as Americanism the idea of the church being independent of the government, but influencing the government. And this, again, they were looking back to the day when the government supported the church and all this sort of thing. So a group of German Americans petitioned Pope Leo XIII to condemn Americanism. So they asked him to condemn it. The Pope sent a letter to Cardinal Gibbons pointing out ideas that he had been told were contained in Americanism and considered to be errors. Cardinal Gibbons responded by saying that the ideas condemned were not any part of Hecker's work. Hecker was not condemned, okay? So he was never condemned by Leo the 13th. And, and what do we see here? I'll give you an example of this in the writings of St. Paul. St. Paul tells slaves that you have to be obedient to your masters and do it in a good way and this sort of thing and tells them how to do that, okay? And he tells masters how you have to treat slaves and this sort of thing. Well, it's easy to say that Paul is advocating slavery, but that would be wrong. Paul was never advocating slavery. But the fact of the matter is there were Catholics who were slaves and had to know how to live. Like suppose my master orders me to be sinfully involved in, in breeding, I suppose I'm his slave, and he orders me to be involved with one of the other female slaves because he's breeding slaves. What do I do? Paul says, in those situations, your master is in charge. It's his problem. You're in a situation where for your survival, your peace, you need to do what you're told and do it well. And so this, this was presented in this way. And again, the book that we see Hecker came out with, did not advocate that the church and everything should be independent of the government. What he did was show how the church can function in a land where they are independent of the government and can still influence it, okay? Now, problems were brewing at this point in South America, okay? We're in the late, late 1800s. Many clergy tried to bring the gospel to the people but many more were lazy and kept themselves apart from the people. Uh, it's, it's interesting if you go to the great haciendas of South America that date from this period in history, and there are a lot of them still around, you'll notice every one of them has a chapel. And that's because 
priests worked for the wealthy people. They would live in their homes there and they would uh, say mass for them privately and this sort of thing. Uh, uh, the, our, the bishop who was murdered in uh, South America uh, probably about, uh, maybe about 35 years ago now, um, when, when he became bishop, uh, the movie on his life, if you watch the movie, wealthy people would come to him and want their children baptized without any of the Indian children present at the baptism. Whereas, you know, we do baptisms in large groups of people, but the wealthy people didn't want that. And so there was this, this cleavage and the church again was attached to the wealthy. And a lot of the clergy, that, that was their lifestyle. There were wealthy people, lived like landed uh, royalty and, and served these, these uh, people. Large landowners like the church and the bishops were extremely conservative. And one of the reasons is liberals at that time were advocating the dividing of land among the poor in order to prevent these kind of revolutions where the poor would just take the land. So they were advocating the division of land. But the church was a major landowner, and the other landowners really stood against it as conservatives. You know, one of the things you learn in the study of, of liberalism in society, you have to be very careful about standing against liberalism, which is advocating new ideas, because usually many of those new ideas will come in, and you don't want to be trampled under. You have to be open to them. Not all the ideas in a liberal movement are going to survive, but some of them will. And so you don't want to end up just standing against it as a block, or worse, accepting it as a block. Okay, You, do, you don't do either, either thing. Liberals among the people were at this point very anti-clerical and often very anti-Catholic, okay? The ideas of the Enlightenment were strong among the educated. Now remember we're talking South America. Both po politicians and clergy were largely corrupt and served only themselves. White officials of both the church and the state discriminated against native peoples. And you see that in the, in the church where, uh, you know, that, that went on in the United States. When I was a youngster, that was going on. There was a great discrimination in the United States against non-Irish. And first tier was native-born Irish. Second tier was American-born Irish. And then you began to work down to the others. But you would find in parishes that you'd find older priests who were working a long time and everything that were, let's say, Hispanic or uh, German or something like that, would be overlooked as pastors while younger men who came as missionaries from Ireland, uh, I think one of the, uh, the big seminaries in Ireland, I think it's Maynooth, I don't know which one, one of the large seminaries in uh, Ireland produced priests almost exclusively for the United States, by the thousands, you know. And uh, no, the name of the seminary was All Hallows. All Hallows produced these uh, priests for, uh, for the missions, but mainly came to the United States. Church leaders thought that the secular leaders wanted to destroy the church. And to be honest, the secular leaders did. The secular leaders thought that the church supported a shameful and backward social system, and the church did. Okay, so we're talking about South America here. Now we're gonna talk about a really, an, an amazing man that when we look back at the history of the governments in South America, people largely forget this man. But in 1840 in Brazil, a man came to power by the name of Pedro II. He was what was called a constitutional monarch, uh, ruling an educated, uneducated and poor country. So he came in, uh, in Brazil. He was the monarch, but a constitutional monarch. That meant you had parliament and stuff like that. But he was a constitutional monarch. He encouraged education he built up the rubber and coffee industries in the country. Slavery was abolished. 
religious freedom and freedom of the press were guaranteed. Okay, so he did these things. Now look at them and, and how good they are. And he was bringing the society forward. The key thing is with a, uh, what do you want to call this, constitutional monarch or a dictator, is he in there for his benefit or the benefit of the society? This man is clearly for the benefit of the society, okay? I think oftentimes we see on TV the uh, am amazing pictures from uh, the country of Qatar in uh, uh, the Arabian Peninsula and just remarkable buildings and, and health centers and stuff like this and it's just, it's just gorgeous. And one of the reasons is the monarch there took all the money from oil and put it into the country, not into himself. Now, if you go into Saudi Arabia and these other countries, you see an immense amount of poverty and immense amount of unspeakable wealth at one level in the society. There's so much money there that people don't have to do anything. The government will give everyone an allowance. But the money isn't spread evenly like it is in Qatar, and you see this amazing society built. So anyway, he did all these things. Now, who was his major enemy? The church. The church did not like religious freedom for others, okay? So we were really anxious to see the Catholic Church free to function, but we weren't anxious to see other churches function. See, the, the interesting thing is freedom of religion came in the United States because we were all small. This wasn't a Catholic country, a Buddhist country, a Methodist country. It wasn't anything. We all came in, so we began to function, and we didn't want the government favoring any other religion for fear they didn't favor us. But if you're in a country where the church has been favored, it's very difficult to see these other churches as equal. And so they didn't like that. And the one thing they didn't like, you know, again, it, I think is the glory of the church, Catholic Church in the United States, this, this equality thing. He says, the rich farmers did not like the idea of the freeing of slaves. Well, we can understand that. The military did not like strict control over their activities in politics. You see, like in the United States, one of the key things, we have a military, but the head of the military is by definition a civilian. The head of the military in the United States is the president, and the president is a civilian. Even, even like um, uh, General Eisenhower, you know, in order to become president, he had to leave the army. And then he could go on and, and become president. But in South America, we oftentimes see the military take over the country and this sort of thing. And the, the military did not like the fact that they could no longer influence this thing under Pedro. He was finally disposed. A republic was established. But he was the outstanding leader of this entire period in South America. He's, you know, he, he really stood out as a powerful leader who was interested in the people, and then he was pushed out largely by the church and wealthy landowners. In China, this was a period, 1900s, of immense missionary activity on the part of the Christian community. And this is the beginning of the great Protestant missionary in China. The China Inland Mission was founded by James Hudson Taylor, a Methodist. Now, again, he was supported by voluntary donations from many denominations, like he was seen as, as teaching um, uh, Christianity, not as Methodist, although he was a Methodist minister, but he wasn't seen as Methodist, Baptist, Anglican, anything. He was seen as just teaching the Christian principles. He made a, no effort to establish missions, didn't build churches or anything. He simply sent people to preach the gospel. They lived among the people and trusted in God to meet their needs. They didn't receive salaries or anything. They just trusted that God would take care of them. And they became a powerful force. Many Catholic missionary groups were also active in China and supported uh, by over 2,000 nuns 
many of whom were Chinese, okay? So the church had 2,000 nuns, but many of them, not the majority, but many of them were Chinese. The Jesuits and Franciscans were joined by the Maryknoll missionaries from the United States. Each country has a, a society of missionaries, and the Society of Missionaries in the United States was Maryknoll. It was founded in New York by a bishop, and uh, the Maryknoll Society, when a missionary society is founded, it's given a particular job, and the job of Maryknoll was China. When they were thrown out of China, their job became South America. But initially, they went to China. Although there were 700 native Chinese priests, many missionaries were hostile to Chinese culture and would not give any real responsibilities to the Chinese, like I was showing with the Irish in the United States, so that you would have these foreign missionaries as pastors and they would allow Chinese priests to work with them in the parishes, but they would not allow Chinese priests to be you know, in charge. And like if you go into LA now, one of the Vietnamese uh, refugees is a bishop in LA today, is one of the bishops in LA. So the idea is to give responsibility to these people, okay? Vincent Leb fought hard for the Chinese church but it was not until after the First World War that the church would be entrusted to the Chinese, okay? So it, it, it took the First World War before they ever uh, entrusted the church to the Chinese. Often missionary activities was tied to internal politics, so it would be allowed for a while, stopped at other times, and the effects of Western imperialism, so that if the the Americans took over a section of China, then had a lot of missionary work by American missionaries, uh, the English in another area. Several secret societies were founded in China to fight Western influences, and the one we know most is called the Boxer Rebellion. Resentment resulted in the massacre of foreigners, and 16,000 Chinese Christians were murdered. Eight nations sent a force of soldiers to put down the rebellion, and kill those responsible for the Western deaths. And so that was the Boxer Rebellion. At the end of the Boxer Rebellion, the uh, Western powers got together and put it down. So we'll stop, it, stop there and pick it up again next week. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>